right, ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the most challenging topics for students to get a grasp on, and it is making the connection between a function and its derivative. <coughs> Excuse me. However, we are not just using our derivative rules in this case anymore. We are actually trying to match the graph of a function with its derivative, and the challenge is that the graph of a function and the graph of a derivative really represent two different things. So you can see here that the graph of a function, each point represents the x and y values for the location of each point on the function. So this is the graph of f of x equals x squared, our parent graph for a quadratic equation. It's got that nice parabola shape to it. The table of values on the left here shows five points on the graph. We've got the point negative 3, 9, which to get to we would go negative 3 in the x direction, and then positive 9 in the y direction. We can do the same thing to get to negative 2, 4, 0, 0, 2, 4, and 3, 9. That's old hat. We've been doing that for a long, long time, graphing functions and recognizing graphs um, from their functions is something that we do regularly and, and are, are fluent in at this point. But now we're looking at the graph of a derivative. Now, believe it or not, this graph right here is the corresponding graph of the derivative for y equals x squared. They look very different, but we can make some sense of this if we understand what the graph represents. So the derivative of a function we call f prime of x, and each point on the derivative graph doesn't represent a point from the function. As you can see right here, each point on the derivative graph is now labeled x f prime of x. So each point represents the x and y prime values for the corresponding point from the function. What does that mean? Well, let's use an easy point to begin with. Let's go over to our function. And I think that we can all agree that on the function here, at x equals 0, we could draw a horizontal tangent line representing that the slope at x equals 0 is 0. Therefore, the point on the derivative graph would be 0, 0. Now, what does 0, 0 mean? 0, 0 means that on the original function, when x equals 0, the derivative value is 0. So we plot the point 0, 0 on the derivative graph. Okay, easy enough. Why is this linear, though? Why is the derivative linear? Well, the easy answer is use your derivative rule and take the derivative of x squared, and the derivative is 2x. So you graph y equals 2x, and there's your derivative. But why? And the answer lies in the slopes. Take any point on the right side of the paragraph for the quadratic equation here. Let's just use the point 3, 9. So 3, 9 is right here. If we were to draw a tangent line at the point 3, 9, what kind of a slope would it have? Be positive. In fact, if we plugged 3 into the derivative function, 2 times 3 would give us 6 which would represent the slope at the point 3, 9 on the original function, which is why on the derivative graph you can see the point 3, 6 is plotted because what the point represents on the derivative graph is at x equals 3 on the function, the slope of the function at that point is 6. All of our slopes on the right hand side of the function are positive, which is why the derivative graph on the right hand side is always above the x-axis. Keep in mind that each of the 
coordinates on the derivative graph represent the value of the slope from the function. So if all of your slopes are positive, then the derivative graph will be above the x-axis. On the other hand, the left-hand side of the graph. If we look at the left-hand side of the graph, for example, let's use the point negative 3, 9. At negative 3, 9, if we were to draw a tangent line here, that tangent line would be something with a negative slope. Because of that, if we go over to the derivative function, if you were to take negative 3 and substitute it in for x into the derivative function, you would get negative 6, which is why the point negative 3, negative 6 is on our derivative graph. What does that represent? That represents that on the function where x is negative 3, the slope at that point on the function is negative 6, which is why we plot it below the x-axis because the derivative graph represents our slopes from the function. So on the left-hand side of the function, all of our slopes over here are negative, which is why the derivative graph to the left of zero is completely below the x-axis. In fact, you can take it to the next level and you can say, all right, if we are close to zero, maybe between zero and one, we know that these are positive slopes. But are they really positive numbers, or are they not so big? And if you were to draw tangent lines here, all the slopes between 0 and 1 are pretty small positive numbers, which is why on the derivative graph between 0 and 1, we have small positive numbers above the x-axis, because those represent the fact that if we were to look at the function between 0 and 1, our slopes are positive, but they're not big numbers. Now, if we move out here to where x equals 3, our slopes are getting real big, which is why if we go over to the derivative graph at x equals 3, our slopes are getting more positive. If we were to continue y equals x squared, <coughs> excuse me, it would just keep going up and its slopes would continue to get more and more positive, which is why on the derivative graph it would keep getting more and more positive as well. This can be a challenging idea because we're so used to looking at graphs as functions and just looking at the points as just that, points. But on a derivative graph, each point represents something different. It represents the slope that corresponds to the x value from the function. We have a worksheet that helps us practice this idea. And it's called matching functions with their derivatives. You're asked to look at the f graphs on the left-hand side of the sheet, and there are 15 of them, and match them with their corresponding g graphs on the right-hand side. The f graphs represent the function, and the g graphs represent the derivative. So f1 is a pretty easy one to start with. If this is the function, no matter which point we choose on this function, you can see it is just a horizontal line here. There's no value for what that horizontal line is, so let's call it maybe y equals negative 2. Take any point on that function, and the slope is going to be 0, which means on the derivative graph, no matter what x value you have, the corresponding y prime value has to be 0. So this point here, let's call it negative 3, negative 2. Since the slope is 0 on the derivative graph, we should see the point negative 3, 0. At this point, negative 1, negative 2. The slope is 0. So on the corresponding derivative graph, we should see the point negative 1, 0 which is why f1 matches with g8. Take something like f2. f2 is a linear function. Linear functions have a constant slope. Now we don't know what the slope is because it didn't give us values, but we know that all of the points on this function 
have the same slope and it's negative because this is a decreasing function. If they all have the same negative slope, the only graph over on the derivative side that can match with it is g1 because g1 is a horizontal line representing the same negative slope value at any x value no matter what. f5 should look familiar. f5 is a parabola. If we look at f5, there's a little tick mark here. That represents the vertex of that parabola. At the vertex, if we draw a tangent line, the slope is zero. If we look over at the g functions, there should be one of the g functions where at that same tick mark, the g function is going through the x-axis, representing that the slope at that point is zero. If we look over here, there's a lot of these that we can rule out. One of them kind of gives it away. G5 has this tick mark here, and people would say, oh, that must match with F5. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Now, how do we know that's not the case? G5 is actually the same exact graph as F5, but if we think about the slopes of F5, all of the slopes to the right of this tick mark are positive, which means our G5 function should be above the x-axis which it is. Unfortunately, the left side of our F5 graph, all of the slopes are negative, which means our G5 function needs to be below the x-axis representing negative slopes, but it's above. So F5 does not match to G5. In fact, the correct answer is that F5 matches with G3. If we take another look, the slope at that tick mark should be zero. So the G function goes through the x-axis, representing a slope of zero at that corresponding point on the function. All of our slopes to the right of the tick mark are positive, which is why on our g function here, it's above the x-axis, representing positive values of slope for all of the points to the right of that tick mark. And to the left of the tick mark, we've got all negative slopes, which is why the G3 graph is completely below the x-axis to the left of the tick mark, representing negative slopes. Some of these are actually kind of cool to look at, and cool might be a relative word for some of you, but the ones that, that I find to be kind of most um, eye-opening, I guess, would be a graph like F9. F9 you should recognize as the parent graph for y equals cosine of x. We know that the derivative of cosine of x is negative sine of x. So if you look over at the g functions, g2 represents negative sine of x. Normally the sine graph goes through the origin and comes up, but since it's negative sine, it starts at the origin and goes down. So f9 matches with g2. Now Looking at it in terms of the derivative rules, that makes a lot of sense. But if you look at the slopes, it makes even more sense. We could draw three horizontal tangent lines on F9, which means on the G function, where each of those tangent lines occurs, the G function should be going through the x-axis one, two, three times. If you look between this relative minimum on F9 and its relative maximum, all of the slopes between there are positive, which is why G2 is completely above the x-axis in that region. If you look between the relative max and the relative min, all of our slopes there are negative, which is why the G2 function is completely below the x-axis, representing negative slopes. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but once you get the hang of it, you should be able to match any function with its derivative graph. And this is a topic that you will definitely see on your upcoming quiz, on your upcoming test, and it is a very, very common topic on the AP exam, specifically the AB exam. Almost every year, you're going to see a free response question dedicated to this topic.